six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have lift off at two thirteen. And it is clear the tower. Prepare yourself for a world of science. Welcome, everybody. It's Conley here with the Science Nights. And you know what? Dr. Anurban Bhattacharjee is still out on the field doing some very, uh, very good research. We're going to hear from him here a little later on uh, in these uh, few episodes that we're doing right now. But you know what? The two knights are assembled here. We have Dr. Thomas Schiller and Dr. Sean Graham, and they're going to be talking about the unifying theory of biology. And uh, could I say that, is that the theory of everything? It's, you know, there's uh, e each field, each field has its, its theory that kind of pulls all the ideas together and where very little makes sense uh, unless this, unless, unless the theory is there. Right. And that's what a unifying theory is. And that's what we're going to talk about today for biology. And this is cutting edge. Cutting edge. This is a lot of people are talking about it, um, and it's it's a really big deal. It relates to my field too, in paleontology. It relates to yeah. A lot of times, unifying theories in other fields reach farther um, than the field itself, and it, it really is important for geology and paleontology as well. And by the end of the episode, we're going to try to convince you that this is actually so important. It's life or death. It's it's life or death that you understand this. And so we're going to talk about the unifying theory of biology today. Unifying theory of biology. Well, okay. What, can you uh, kick us off yeah, with yeah. a definition? Yeah. So um, it, this this theory, I think we're going to have to go through this kind of... Uh, it, now, it is a theory, not a it, hypothesis. It's definitely not a hypothesis. A ton of evidence. For okay. It. And the, of evidence. the difference between a, a theory and a hypothesis is that, you know, it, it, a ton of evidence supports this and it's got these far-reaching implications. Um, and so it's 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 this big foundation. We've we've got a lot of the evidence for it now. Yeah. It's about as close to a fact as you can. Oh yeah. Get. Well, that's the thing about a theory. A theory can also be a fact. It can be supported by tons of facts. And so when we explain to you what this is, uh, every every little step of the explanation is supported by tons of facts. But let me let me start it out by kind of uh, giving you a quick anecdote. When I was in the field one time in uh, South Georgia looking for salamanders, we've met this super nice family that let us um, hang out at their at their place. We were, we were, can we look in your backyard in the swamp for salamanders? I said, yeah. And then when we came back, they, they made us barbecue and they gave, they, we were drinking beers with them. They were just great. And um, they were explaining to us that they had this problem. They were farmers. They had this problem with their crop that they were out there and they had this pest problem, some sort of insect, and they were, they were spraying their crops with these pesticides. But it seemed like every year the pests, like some subset of these insects, you know, stuck around, didn't, the pesticides didn't kill them all. And so they kept getting, they kept kind of surviving year, one year to the next, one generation to the next. And they kept getting, they had to put more and more of this pesticide on them to make sure that they killed them. And it just, it's like they were developing resistance to this pesticide. And so we, and they were like, well, you're biologists, tell us what's going on. And uh, we could tell these people, you know, we were like, well, so this, this has to do with the unifying theory of biology. What's going on here? And so this is, this is it. This is, this is the, the theory right here. It's very simple. All populations have variability, right? All populations of everything. Uh, plants, insects, animals. Meaning that they change. No, it means that within, within, like, so within a group, like within those insects that are out in their field, sure. not all of them are exactly the same. Some of them are slightly bigger, right? right. That's what we mean by variation. They're slightly bigger. They might be slightly different in color. There's variation within the population. That's it. Um, and <clears throat> so, and you can measure this, right? This, yeah. this is one of those parts of the theory that's a fact. Nobody, nobody disputes this. You can go out to any population of anything you want, whether a plant, an insect, a fish, measure them, 
do really detailed measurements and you'll find that there's like an average size, but on either side of that average, there's some that are slightly bigger, some that are slightly smaller, some have slightly bigger, you know, teeth or beaks, right? Each individual look at birds, is very unique. Each, each individual is unique, but the population is all over the place. It's very sure. variable. And that's a fact. Right. We, we now understand what causes that variation. We understand the genetics behind it, right? And that the other part of this, another component of the theory is that all populations are variable and that variability can be inherited one generation to the next, right? Uh, we understand genes. We understand that genes and that small changes in those genes just by chance, which we call mutations, cause variation. That's where the source of the variation comes from. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this isn't something new, right? I mean, experiments have been done even before we had advanced technology and, and genetic science where we could actually tell that, that these traits are, are passed on, right? Yeah, this, this part of the theory um, is actually uh, pretty old. You know, 1860s, Gregor Mendel, we talked about him before in a different episode. He's a monk and he's doing experiments with peas and he figures out how that how the variations within pea plants are inherited one generation to the next and it's a very uh you know quantitative very numerical process very you can predict it 100 percent if you understand the way those genes are inherited you know exactly what proportion of the pea plants are going to be a certain color or have a certain shape it's very you know the units of inheritance which we now call genes we understand that stuff real well. Yeah. Yeah. The listeners probably in high school did Punnett Square. Yeah. The Punnett Squares. Yeah. yeah. So we understand that, you know, that variation that's within the population, these maybe slightly different color, blue eyes, brown eyes, height, all that stuff's controlled by genes and it goes one generation to the next. Here's the second part. Okay. So that's, that's the part about variation and what causes it and that it's inherited one generation to the next. So the next component is that, you know, a simple observation that not all of the young from one generation to the next are going to survive, right? There's not an equal chance. If you, and the best example of this, if you were to take, you know, one of those puffball mushrooms, you ever seen one of those growing out of the ground? It's, it's, a, it's this big kind of bag of spores. And mm -hmm. if you kick it, a million black spores. It's like, it's like a plume of smoke comes out of this thing. And every one of those little spores is a, a another puffball. <laughs> and so it, you can do some simple math. There's like billions of spores in these puffballs. If every one of those puffballs survived to adulthood and had more puffballs, then the world would be totally taken over by these puffball mushrooms within like 10 generations. It's actually less than that. And you can do that math for any organism on earth, including humans. If every single human being has another human being and that human being, it, it adds up. So th this is simple math. And if knowing that, knowing that not every single offspring of every single fish and, and oak tree and maple is going to survive to reproduce, that means that if you take that first part, the variation, some of them will be able to survive and reproduce and some of them won't because of that variation. Some of the, you know, the traits that are within that population, blue eyes, green eyes, spots. Dominant traits? Doesn't have to be dominant. It can be dominant, can be recessive. Mm. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, some of those traits will lead to some of them having a better chance of leaving behind babies. But monster. there's some control on that, right? I mean, there has to be. Like you said, if, if there wasn't, then we'd have Earth covered in, in these spores. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that not everything's going to make it, and, and, and that means that some, some of the variation, some of those traits are going to be favorable and, and, and lead to a better chance of them having offspring that reproduce. And some, some of that variation might be bad, and they'll have less chance of leaving behind progeny or offspring. So put all that together, that means that over the generations, um, because some of these traits are favorable, the population can change over time. So you can have this shift from, you know, let's take, let's think about a bird and its beak, right? You got a, a finch. <clears throat> oh, I see. And it's got, it's got, you know, a triangular shaped beak that is a certain depth, right? And so it can feed on certain sizes of seeds. And if for some reason the environment, right, um, suddenly has a lot more of a certain size seed, 
over the generations, right, within that population, there's going to be a bunch of different shapes of beaks. They're not going to be perfectly exactly the same. Some of them are going to be slightly bigger. Some are going to be slightly smaller. Some are going to be medium sized. But because the environment can kind of shift and different seeds might be available and other seeds might not be, that finch might be able to, the one with the biggest beak might be able to eat the seeds and the others, unfortunately, sorry, they starve to death, right? So that in maybe 10 years, 10 generations, the finch's beak might slightly shift. The population will slightly shift over 10, 50 years to where uh, it's a different size than you started with when you started measuring. And you you're, you're, might be looking at me like, well, who's going to sit around for 50 years and do those measurements? Their name, it's a, it's a husband and wife team. Grant and Grant did that. They did that with finches on the Galapagos Islands. And they showed a shift in size in the beak shape of these finches over about 50 years. They did it for decades. They measured them. They had the entire population banded. They knew which individuals were what. They established that the beaks were heritable, that the, the trait size was actually heritable. It was going from one generation to the next. And over, you know, several uh, dozen finch generations, they, they saw a significant change in the beak size of these finches over time. And so it's been demonstrated in, in nature that this happens. Yeah. And, and you bring up the finches too. And another thing to, to mention, uh, the reason that, that the finches on the Galapagos are, are such a great example of this unifying theory um, is because they're, they're in isolated populations, right? The Galapagos Islands are yeah. kind of small, isolated populations. Yeah. So um, you don't have as much gene flow, to, yeah. to say, in biological And, and the, so the, if you take that, if you extend that further, right? So we've demonstrated this happens over decades. And it's happened slow, but it's a significant change. But the implication there is that a finch flew to the Galapagos Islands, probably from the mainland in South America. And that's where all the finches on the Galapagos came from. It, and they have different shaped beaks. Some of them are really big, like a grosbeak beak or like a cardinal for cracking big seeds. Some are smaller and narrower for feeding on insects. Some are really like needle shaped and they actually, you know, feed, at least there's a mockingbird on the Galapagos that feeds on blood. All right. It's a, it's a vampire. So the implication for these small changes that we can observe happening in nature over in it still, it takes a long time, but you can, you can observe it. You can measure it is that this leads to new species. You know what those what they call those finches? Geospiza. That's the genus. That's the genus. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's the implication is that these slow changes that happen over uh, over uh, you know short periods of time. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you add that millions of years, right, then you can get big changes. So over short time periods, like within a human lifetime, you, the Grant team, Grant and Grant. They've observed some significant changes, but, you know, they haven't seen a new species appear. But the implication is that if you're given enough time, you can. And there's good evidence for this happening, too. Um, you know, a good example in human history, uh, within human time frame, where we have good records and we have a good historical record of this, human uh, breeders have uh, cause these kind of changes by selecting certain traits that, that we appreciate. We can kind of speed it up. We can speed it up. And so uh, the gray wolf, you know, genetic evidence shows this, fossil evidence shows this, archaeological evidence shows this, historical evidence shows this, that the gray wolf is the ancestor of all modern dog breeds. And that modern dog breeds, most of the breeds that you're familiar with are only like, as, like 300, 400 years old. And we know this because breeders keep records. So all, the, all that variety, think of the dogs, right? From a Great Dane to a Chihuahua, the source was the gray wolf. And it was just from us. That, now, the cool thing is that variation within the population, we got to choose which traits we liked. And I, I got to tell you, folks, the, the traits we didn't like, you know, often in the early days, it would have been the dogs that we didn't like that uh, didn't get to breed would have been eaten by us. And then modern breeders, at least sort of modern breeders, would have taken the puppies in like and dump them. Right. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. And, you know, modern, uh, you know, uh, cow breeders, they don't like put the cow down that they don't like, but they castrate them. 
So they take the bulls that they like the features of, and then they castrate the ones they don't like, and only the bulls of the features they do like get to breed. And so we're doing this, and but the cool thing about that is that think about the big changes that we can get from this pretty much the same process. And it's the same, it's exactly the same thing. You're seeing the, the genetic variation is there. We're just choosing what we like. And we've seen some major leaps from from the gray wolf to what we have today. My I, I never point to the Chihuahua because I kind of like Chihuahuas, <laughs> but I always point to to pugs. Like a Chihuahua is, is, is a good um, a good alert dog, right? It'll bark if someone's yeah. trying to intrude or something. But yeah. They're trying pug. to make a pug sleep apnea machine. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to look at every single organism that lives on this planet and pugs are cute and I'm sorry, I'm going to have some people out there who hate me because of this, but you look at every organism on this planet, animals, plants, the pug is something that should not exist. Yeah. yeah. Why is it here? Yeah. Even yeah. looking just even looking in, in different dog breeds. Yeah. It's like the, the earliest dog breeds that were bred had some sort of function. They yeah. were hunting dogs or they were ratting dogs. Good food. Good food. They were, they, <laughs> they were tasty. Pugs yeah. were just bred because they were this weird looking yeah. thing. Yeah. It was novelty. It was novelty. Yeah. Well, yeah. for me, it's more reason to believe in God. Right. But, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I do what? have a question for you, Sean. <laughs> um, speaking of these interesting uh, biological feats, if we will, right? Uh, these miraculous uh, organisms that we see every day. Well, we see a specific uniqueness in one area of the world, and that which is uh, from where your wife is from, uh, Australia. Australia. Yeah. So my question is, how can you explain the duck-billed platypus I don't know if I want to feed it a loaf of bread or make it build me a dam somewhere or <laughs> whatever you do. Don't pick it up. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know how yeah. it yeah. has, um, uh, how much time, do, how much time this, do we have? Yeah, in this segment? Well, I, I don't know how it, this unifying theory of biology, you know, yeah. Uh, so no, this is good. You're pointing at, you're pointing about out three minutes. Yeah. Well, you're pointing out this kind of great uh, example because again, the, the beak changes over 50 years is not, you know, blowing anyone's skirt up. Right. Sure. It's like, Oh, but the implication is that it could cause these humongous changes and you could end up with a platypus from this exact same process. Right. It just have, it has to take place over a much longer time period. And so the platypus is a good example, but you know, going back, you know, the original, uh, you know, some of the early people who, uh, who were digging up this stuff and formulating this theory, they didn't focus on dogs as much. And, and some of those, other, what they, what they like to talk about are, are pigeons, right? Fancy pigeons that people, because at the time that this theory was developed, um, that was, it was all the rage in England and, and in Europe that people were breeding pigeons and you wouldn't believe the kind of crazy pigeons that you can get from simply taking the variation of a, of a rock dove, which are flying around in cities and in Alpine right now, it's just the common city pigeon. And by choosing uh, features that appear randomly within that population, you can get crazy pigeons with extremely long legs and like weird feathers like that look, make them look like they've got a perm and all kinds of crazy stuff. And like the frock? Yeah. And the original uh, formulator of this theory pointed out that if, if you gave those pigeons to a zoologist, they would have classified them in completely different genera from each other. They would have been, yeah, they're so different that if he didn't know any better or if she didn't know any better, a zoologist would have said, these things aren't even remotely related to each other, yet they all were you know, bred by breeders from the rock dove within recorded human history. Like we got records of when they appeared and, and how they, and all of that. And that's the, the kind of the biological definition of a genus or a species. If, if a paleontologist were, were to look oh, at yeah. that group or, or dogs for they that They might matter, call them different families. There'd be a yeah, hundred different families. So of, your uh, duck-billed platypus suddenly becomes totally plausible. They're, they're that weird looking. They're that weird looking. And it happened within like a couple hundred years from people breeding them. Well, maybe after so the break. So imagine if you had millions of years of this sure. happening. Oh, yeah, millions. And millions. we're going to talk about the but, evidence for that um, right after the break, I guess. So you were talking about a break. Well, yeah. Talk about I mean, break? after the break, maybe we can uh, also answer the question of how does human intervention affect the uh, unifying theory of biology? Mm-hmm. 
maybe you can expand on that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, everybody. This, the Knights are back. Science Knights in the morning. We're still talking about a very important topic, the unifying theory of biology. And we're gonna, by the end of this episode, you're going to be thinking, this is life or death to understand this. And Conley asked me about human intervention, and I think he was alluding to, I'm, I'm giving all these kind of examples of where people are doing, they're choosing these traits that they like. And the way, so the thing is with science, you need to have experimentation, right, in order to back things up. And to me, uh, these breeding experiments that people have been doing for 10,000 years are the evidence, right, that this process can happen. So it's a natural process. <clears throat> that happens. Mother Nature does this. The environment changes. Uh, populations change over time because the environment changes or uh, a new predator is introduced, something like that. There's something happening. But, you know, you got to be able to show that the process happens. And so, in a sense, in essence, human breeders have been showing that this process happens. And the, and the crucial piece of the evidence there is that big changes can happen in short time periods. Yeah. So that's where that's important to talk about domestic animals. Cause the, the, I think the thing that a lot of people doubt about this important theory, they'll, they'll even, they'll say, Oh yeah, yeah. Bacteria in a test tube. Yeah. You'll see a change in the generation. I mean, that's undisputable. Honestly, that's another fact we can, we can see it in insects, like the pesticide resistance example I gave, that happens. There's no dis disputing it. It's a fact. They develop pesticide re resistance through this process. And bacteria develop resistance to our antibiotics by this process. And we'll talk about that at the end. That's the life or death part. So that's undisputed. But then they'll say, oh, no, no, it's still just a bacteria, right? Nothing. You don't have a new species. Well, the evidence for the fact that you can have huge changes comes from our selective breeding that we've had over the past 10,000 years with wolves, with broccoli, with wheat. It's all changed. It's all happened. And big changes have happened in a short time period. So all we're saying is that Mother Nature can do this, and it takes a long time. Well, we, we can see it happen in reverse, too, right? With We've, we've talked about feral pigs mm -hmm. in previous oh, yeah. episodes. Feral pigs, <laughs> what is it, maybe one or two generations that a... a a pig that you have on out on your on your farm can become a a woolly monstrous feral <laughs> pig with with tusks. Yeah, yeah, and and put on some serious pounds and and in order to you know to live in that environment now where it's got things chasing it all the time, it gets quite a lot more aggressive and and that sort of thing. So yeah, that is can go back and forth. But you know now that we've established this unifying theory. Um, another name for it, uh, descent with modification, right? So it's, it's populations, and, and while the, the descendants of the original population have become modified by nature. That's, that's what it is. And let's talk about evidence for this, because right now, you know, we set it up and we talked about how there's facts involved. But, um, you know, if this is true, that means the fossil record should be replete with examples of, of shifts in body forms over time. Yeah, and it is. Um, and that's saying a lot, considering the nature of the fossil record. And in the past, we've talked about how incomplete the fossil record is mm -hmm. and how that's kind of a, a problem when it comes to paleontology and um, understanding the, the history of organisms on Earth. But we do have several cases where we can see these, these changes, these transitions take place um, in the anatomy of, of organisms. Yeah, how about, how about like a top five of like the good transitional fossils that show big changes? Okay, so um, let's start. We'll start with, with fishes to tetrapods. Oh, yeah, yeah. We talked about that recently in an episode. Um, where we see a transition taking place, of course, not on the same kind of short time scale as, as wolves to, to domestic dogs. Yeah. But over a few million years, we see fish that are fully aquatic transitioning to animals that can live and walk around on land. Yeah, yeah. So there's a major transition. There. And, and really a good, a good series of fossils that show intermediary steps, including... If you want to listen to our episode about Tiktaalik, a 50-50 yeah. fish. Basically every stage in between. Um, and we see that moving forward. We see that um, when it comes to, to mammals. Mm -hmm. We have mammal-like reptiles transitioning to 
reptiles that are even more mammal like. That's, that's a really good one, and that one's a that's a really good one where we have a really good fossil sequence that shows uh, things that look nothing like modern mammals. The sailback, Dimetrodon, those guys are actually pretty closely related to mammals, and then modern mammals. And I just I just covered this because I'm teaching a mammalogy class. My favorite part about that is the the jawbone. These two small bones that are present in some of the early mammal-like reptiles uh, over time in the fossil record become kind of miniaturized and then they uh, eventually migrate into the inner ear and become the incus and malleus, the tiny little inner ear ossicles that help vibrate sound waves. And yeah, Conley just made this incredible expression like, no way. The best part about this is that we've got evidence from another line of evidence that this is how it happened because the fossil record shows it. It shows it. Uh, by the time you're full of mammal, the, the jawbone is a single bone. Yeah, the dentary. The dentary, right? Now, we have evidence from developmental biology that this happened too because when you are a little spud in the womb, you actually have those tiny little bones in your jaw and they become miniaturized and migrate into your inner ear during development too. So the development actually kind of repeats the process that happened with descent from yeah. with modification. And I, I guess if we're, if we're going to talk about fishes, we're kind of jumping back a little bit. One of the common phrases we use in, in natural science and biological science or paleontology is ontogeny recapitulates. Phylogeny. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a mouthful. It's a mouthful, you but I'll, I'll put it in a, simple terms. I think about a cereal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would be concerned if you were eating a cereal called Ontogeny Recapitulates Phylogeny. <laughs> it had a toy in it. <laughs> a little, a little embryo. <laughs> so, so this has to do with with the embryological stages of of vertebrates, um, animals that that have a backbone. If we look at the embryos, the early developmental stages of vertebrates. We see that at least at the earliest stages, everything looks almost identical. Mm -hmm. Everything looks like a little fish. It has yep. a tail. It has gill slits. It has two big eyes. It all looks very similar. Okay. This suggests a link, okay. uh, basically an origin from which all of these other groups have, have emerged. But... Um, you know, maybe that that's, we could probably spend the whole episode talking about yeah. ontogeny, recapitulating phylogeny, yeah, but, but you have gills when you're like two weeks old. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. And you wouldn't really expect that pattern. This is where it becomes a unifying theory because how else would you explain that? Right. Like, what, what other theory could account for that? There's a lot of commonality. Yeah. Within. I mean, it, it just ties, it ties really? everything together. It ties yeah. developmental biology together. Everything in paleontology makes, makes sense. When you're spraying your crops and the insects every year keep getting more and more resistant, that it explains that. I mean, it explains everything. Yeah. And that's that's the the, the phy phylogeny aspect of that kind of um, associating everything to to a single common ancestor. So it goes back to paleontology, and, and we're talking about these major transitional events. And yeah, we did we did. I think we have got we did two. We did two. Yeah, yeah. We talked about. Let's, let's hit the other three, three more real quick. What about is there is there a good uh, transitional fossil between like a reptile that doesn't look like a turtle and one that looks like a turtle? There is, yeah, and and this That's is another one. thing that you know when we talked about Tiktaalik um, was debated for a while because yeah. we didn't have that transitional fossil, but fairly recently we have a transitional fossil between what is like a lizard like reptile. What I love and about this, it, it, it's got half a shell. Yeah. Yep. Turtles in the half shell. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Turtle so power. The, I forget. I think it's the bottom part. That is that the part you would think? You would think the top part would, would develop first, but actually the, the bottom yeah. part and then eventually the top part. Huh. There is there a um is there a, a frogamander? There's a there is a, <laughs> there's a frogamander. These are loaded questions. I, I already know the answer. Yeah. There is a frogamander. There's an incredible frogamander from Texas. Discovered in the red beds, the Permian red beds, and it's exactly what you would think that uh, something between a salamander and a frog would look like. It doesn't have quite as long legs as a frog, and it's got way too it's got way too many backbones, too many vertebrae, so it doesn't look real squat and compact like a frog. Yeah. And then what? what I'll let you choose the last yeah. one. Kind of well, well the, the, the big one for me is dinosaurs or non-avian dinosaurs mm -hmm. and birds. That's kind of the the one of the earliest. Um, transitional fossils that we see that kind of proves this theory. 
Yeah, it came uh, out hot on the heels of the original development of the unifying theory of biology. That's right. This transitional fossil mm-hmm. was discovered a couple of years later. Yeah, and that's Archaeopteryx. So um, we talked about Archaeopteryx. I think we had a full episode about Archaeopteryx and feathered dinosaurs. But um, in the case of, of this transitional fossil, we have a animal that is really akin to, to Tiktaalik in the sense that mm-hmm. it, it has 50% yeah. dinosaur or non-avian dinosaur, non-bird dinosaur characteristics, and 50% bird characteristics. Yeah, when's the last time you saw a bird with a mouthful of teeth? Yeah. When's the last time you saw a, bo- a bird with a long bony tail? Yeah, right? exactly. So what you see a, a bird's tail like a, a roadrunner, and it looks like it's got bones in that tail, but the feathers are just shoved into this little peg at the b- back of its uh, pelvis, like, almost like what we have yeah. for a tail. Pygo style. Yeah. And so there's no, there's no bones in that tail, but there is an Archaeopteryx. Um, what else has it got that birds don't got? Um, it has a, 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 a sternal bone. It has a, a sternum. Um, whereas if you look at birds, they have a keel, yeah. so they have this modified bone in their chest. If you've ever butchered a bird or had a Thanksgiving turkey, it has this big, thin plate. I love that we're, we're always relying on people having like these outdoor skills and that. I'm not sure. I well, bet we're probably pretty safe in that. They're like, have you guys ever butchered a pig? <laughs> you guys have butchered a largemouth bass. Yeah, you, know that, what, <laughs> you, you know what its pancreas yeah. looks well, we're, like. We're, so. talking, we're talking to our alpine folks here. <laughs> yeah. These, these are down to people. They we're probably safe. butchered a pig or something. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, so if you've had a Thanksgiving turkey, I, I would suspect most people have had a Thanksgiving turkey. It has a big flat bone that extends up and separates the two, uh, the two muscles of the breast. Um, and then it has, it has clawed fingers. It has separated claw fingers, which, um, again, has that. Yeah, if, you, if, if, you've, if you've had a, a buffalo wild wings, if you've had a hot <laughs> wing before, and you chow down on that, you see that the, that the, the arm and the finger bones are super different in a, in a bird compared to like a lizard or what you would expect a dinosaur to have. So. And it, you know what? If you uh, research the actual fossil that is on record, Right of Archaeopteryx, mm-hmm. you could assume that it does yoga <laughs> because it's, it, it's, it's flexible. <laughs> like it, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, its head is like completely yeah, it's a almost typical, touching it, it's, its a, spine. Yeah, it's here. a typical death position. Da- downward facing dinosaurs. Archaeopteryx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, that has to do with the, the the neck muscles or something like that. Mm-hmm. It, it's a rigor mortis. They do that. They yeah, the oh, tendons really? will contract. Yeah. Even modern birds okay. will do that. Yeah, very yeah. cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, but and they had feathers. They had yeah. feathers. You like can a, see the feather impressions in the fossil, yeah. which is just beautiful. So that's that's one of the best examples of a transitional fossil that we have. So lots of evidence, yeah. fossil evidence. Well, you, you were uh, wanting to know about something else, Conley? Yeah, uh, actually, I was going to transition a little bit uh, with, with all this uh, unifying theory of biology that we're talking about right now. Uh, how are we going to relate it to ourselves? Because, you know, uh, there's organs that we used to use mm-hmm. in antiquity. That we don't use anymore. We don't have any. We, we don't need those organs. We can just tear them out. To <laughs> tell the doctor where to point and have them rip it out of us. Yeah. Like uh, appendix. The appendix uh, is there, a classic. There's a example. lot of uh, there's a lot of different ones. But you know how does the unifying theory of biology kind of relate yeah. to us? The, like we're going to fast forward a little yeah. bit. The the cutting edge researchers who kind of formulated this theory, yeah, you know, kind of devoted a huge section to these kind of residual organs. Um, what was the name for them? Vestigial. Vestigial, yeah. Okay. Vestigial organs and vestigial structures, which really kind of don't make any sense unless you've seen a lot of slow change over generations, right? Uh, where you could expect that uh, organs that are no longer used could potentially kind of dwindle away slowly over generations. And so uh, the human appendix is often given as an example of this. There's a, a structure called a cecum, that is found in many um, mammals that eat a lot of plant material. And it is this big fermentation chamber in the rear part of the gut, you know, the intestines, the large intestine, the colon, that helps to kind of digest plant material. Um, There's a lot of microorganisms held in there that help do that. And it's pretty much thought the the appendix is like a former, um, you know, uh, former one of those, right? Um, and that we don't use as much of that vegetation anymore, so it's kind of residual. Uh, there is actually an idea of where it might actually be useful occasionally. 
most people they know of it is like it just bursts and then you go to the hospital and get it removed. And in the old days, if it burst, you died. All right. So it would be a decidedly bad thing to have the appendix. Um, but this is, uh, there's been a, a hypothesis now that, um, that that's kind of a Western version of what the appendix is like a yeah. modern, you know, like it, it actually could help you if, um, to restore the beneficial microorganisms in your gut after you've had dysentery, which uh-huh. is something that happens to a lot of people in developing nations and would have happened to humans for a long time. But there are plenty of other good examples of vestigial organs. That's, it's still a good example because yeah. it, it's pretty much a, a residual cecum, but it might still have a slight function. Yeah, and I can, I can give one good paleontological piece of evidence. Um, whales. We've, oh, talk, yeah. we've talked in the past about, uh, most recently when we talked about tetrapods, how, how animals will move on to land and then decide, some of them will decide it's better to go back to the water. Mm-hmm. Well, that happened with mammals. Um, whales... You look at a whale and you think, man, this thing must have... Looks like a fish. It looks like a fish. It must have have been suited for living in the water for millions and millions and millions and millions of years. But what the case is, is it actually originated from a four-legged terrestrial mammal. And for some reason or other, that that group decided, hey, we, we, we're we done. need, we we're need done. to head back into the water. <laughs> And, and the, the, the cool, picture, picture of this, everybody, it's this original population, this variation, and then you have this, their descendants are modified over time. Mm-hmm. And then over 60 million years, yeah, we, there's still evidence of the, and that's what you're yeah, going to tell actually us. Ten, actually, just 10 million years, we, oh, we, right. see, we see a transition from what looks like a, like a, four, like a, like a wolf almost, a yeah. wolf or a dog. And then we see this transition over 10 million years to what is a, a whale what we would recognize as a whale today. Um, so the general differences, the broad differences are really apparent. But then when we look closer at even a modern whale, um, specifically if we, we look at, at the, the back part of their body, is um, whales don't have any, any flippers. They don't have any, any, any flippers on the back half of their body. They, they just have pectoral flippers. But if we look back uh, towards the tail, inside of a whale is the remnants of a pelvic girdle, so the pelvic bones, and a femur. Mm-hmm. Okay, now think about that. Wow. If, if this... Is, and ankle is, bones, right? Yeah, some, yeah, some yeah, weird yeah. little wow. ankle little parts. Wow. Yeah, so, so if we look at this animal that, that is fully aquatic, it doesn't have to contend with gravity like a terrestrial animal does. Okay, the purpose of our pelvic girdle, the basket that holds in all of our... our viscera, all of our, our internal organs, is to basically support our organs against gravity. An animal that lives in the water doesn't need that. Fish don't need it, and a whale doesn't need it, but the whale still has it. It still has a tiny little pelvic girdle, and it also has the remnants of limbs, even though it doesn't use them. So this is kind of the perfect example of vestigial yeah. organs. Or and again, elements. there's really like this unifying theory of biology is so spectacular because it makes total sense in light of descent with modification, but it's really hard to explain these vestigial organs with any other theory. Like there are legless lizards, a bunch of different kinds of legless lizards, and some of them show little bitty legs, little flaps where the back leg should be. And inside their body, like the whales, there's little pieces of pelvic bones. And, you know, it's like, how would you, how would you explain that? And that's where snakes came from. They descended. The original population clearly had legs. And that population descended through time over generations and was modified by the environment. And then they lost the legs slowly. And some of them show that they still have little bits of the legs and they're still present. Yeah, we have we have snakes or the, the ancestors of snakes that have tiny little probably yeah, there's fossil snakes yeah. with legs. And even modern snakes, the boas have this is great. I love this ever since I was a kid. You look at a modern male boa and it's got a pair of uh spurs next to its reproductive anatomy that are basically all that's left of the legs of a boa wow. inside of it it's got remnants of a pelvic um girdle and so the the kind of most ancestral of the snakes still show some of those features that lizards have so is it safe to assume that 
Uh, these mammals, like manatees, dolphins, seals, and whales, were once terrestrial and returned back into the ocean. And maybe we can expand on that after the break. Yeah, it's it's not an assumption. We actually have evidence to support yeah, it. So it's, it's fact. It is fact. It is okay. fact. Well, great. Well, maybe we can expand a little bit more on that after the break. And we're going to hear from our sponsor, CDRI. All right. Hello, everybody. We're back. It's Science Nights in the Morning. And we're still talking about the unifying theory of biology. Super important theory that draws together a lot of lines of evidence. And Conley was just asking me about, you know, these marine mammals. And we have evidence that formerly they were terrestrial. A lot of good fossil evidence. And I'll pick up on, the, you know, just seals in general. Uh, I think a lot of listeners, if you were to picture what a seal looks like, it probably wouldn't be terribly surprising to you that all a seal is basically is just a marine aquatic bear. Um, you know, they've got the forearms that are kind of, uh, you know, the transition into flippers, but the, the head of those things and their teeth is still pretty bear-like. The hind legs are kind of stuck together in this kind of weird flipper-like structure, but overall their their behavior is a lot like a bear, and there are bears that are very aquatic, like a polar bear. So, you know, it's kind of intuitive that you can have this. And, and here's where I'll bring in this other huge piece of evidence. We've talked about fossil evidence, vestigial structures, things like that. Lots of evidence from multiple lines all throughout biology, developmental biology. Last piece of the puzzle is genetic evidence. You know, we can take the genes, the genetic code for a bear, for a bunch of bears, and we can compare that to that of seals, and we find that, oh, they're each other's closest relatives. So when we talk about, like, saying that things are close relatives, it kind of makes intuitive sense, I think, to some people. Like, cats and dogs are probably more related to each other than a cat and a dog is to a deer, right? So they, they share a more recent common ancestor after a descent with modification happened, so that they would be more closely related than they would be to rats, and, you know, there's for a long time, we used fossil evidence and, and um, evidence from the structures of, uh, you know, animals like what we call morphology. Um, and we would be able to kind of guess what was close relatives to each other. And we, we even had to do that with with modern animals. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we. Yes. Uh, some of some of our, our older listeners out there might be familiar with the term pachyderm. Mm. Um, yeah. Pachyderm is a good example of this. Before we had genetic evidence or, or genetic means to to link animals together, pachyderms were essentially a, a catch-all for mammals that had leathery skin. Oh, right. Big mammals with leathery yeah, skin. Yeah, yeah. Rhinoceros. But as it turns, yeah, rhinos and elephants and hippos. Mm -hmm. But like you said, as it turns out, they're 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 yeah. separated. Yeah. And the, let's go back to the original idea that descent with modification, right? The original population way back millions of years ago, they might have looked quite a bit different than they do now. And, and they've uh, they've descended over time through generations, millions of years, and they've uh, been modified into new forms. And so, um, it, you know, now we have this powerful evidence from genetic evidence that shows that all in many cases – our, uh, the way we compared these animals to each other was right. That things that we thought looked the same were the same. They're genetically very similar to each other. In other cases, it's shaken things up quite a lot. It's caused surprises. You know, we, we didn't really think that some things were closely related, and the genetics show they are. And then we go, oh, wow. And the amazing thing is, you know, genetics has shown that um, descent with modification is how it works. Um, you can look back as far as you want, millions of years, and, you know, a single origin of life on Earth, and the descendants of that single origin have been modified and have been diverging into new forms quite different from each other ever since. Well, modern genetics, too, um, going back to the, to the earliest divergence that we see, um, we, can, we can look at, like, homeobox genes, right? And we can mm -hmm. associate organisms that are that are related with the genes that that are actually coded to to form their different tissues all right so we can really nail down the kind of differences in their physical structure to the actual genes that cause that and absolutely you can compare whatever genes you want 
And now we're able to actually compare whole genomes, which we mentioned before in the show, is all the genetic material in an organism. For a long time, that was hard to do. That was very hard to do because it takes a long time to get the entire sequence. It's like a, a whole encyclopedia the size of a stadium of information. But now we can do that. We can compare whole, the entire genetic code of one organism to another, and it still supports descent with modification and the unifying, uh, unifying theory of biology. It supports it in every detail. Yep. So we have modern genetic evidence. Mm -hmm. um, we have paleontological evidence. Um, and we even have evidence that we can see um, just in, in our dog yeah. breeds, basically. Yeah, we can see it from, um, you know, we can see how this process would work by this kind of uh, large-scale historical um, breeding that we've been doing. And now uh, you might be thinking, listeners might be thinking, well, this is neat. It's quaint. It's explaining why we have so much cool diversity of life on earth. But what, what's that got to do with me? And this is where it becomes deadly serious because this unifying theory of biology has medical significance. Um, and here's probably the most, um, the best way I can explain this or the most kind of pressing issue is that bacteria um, when you take antibiotics at the doctor, it's to interfere with reproduction or kill bacteria that's trying to take over your body, it's trying to hurt you. It's, it's, a, it's a bug. Um, antibiotics don't work for viruses. They don't work for viruses, just for bacteria. And for about 100 years now, we've had lots of different kinds of antibiotics that can cure you of bacterial infections. Um, the problem is those bacteria reproduce very quickly and there's variation within the populations of bacteria and some of them can be slightly resistant to the antibiotics that we give you. And if some of them survive the treatment of antibiotics, then think about it. If you kill 99% of the bacteria in your body and you leave the 1% alone and it survives, then, it, then it's the only game in town and suddenly you've got the development of resistance to these antibiotics. And this is something you might have heard of. This is a big problem, right? And this is happening. It's been happening all along. We've been making these things. Just like you select the dog breed that you like and you get a Great Dane over time, we're basically creating through this exact same process of descent with modification. We're, we're creating bacteria that are resistant to all of our antibiotics, they're completely resistant to everything. Now, 150 years ago, you could go in your backyard and stub your toe on a stick or a nail and die from that, right? Rusty. Yeah. Uh, like Tennis. most most of the uh, fatalities in the Civil War were from infections, not from gunshot wounds. It was from, you know, getting bayoneted and surviving and then having gangrene, which is a bacterial infection that we can treat now, right? Unless we create these resistant bacteria that can take over. And we've been doing that for like 100 years. We've been creating these what they call superbugs through this exact same process that we're talking about. And that kind of leads into our next episode, doesn't it? About oh, viruses. Yeah, we, we we're going to talk about coronavirus next time. Uh, you're going to be able to hear that. And actually, we may, we may end up airing that one sooner because it's such a pressing issue. So you might hear that one before you hear this one, yeah. but we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And well, we'll see. Yeah. In either case, we're, we're talking about, about serious issues related to... Yeah. And even cor coronavirus, we can jump ahead. You know, when it jumps to a new host, it happens because the variation within that population of viruses, some of them are able to get into humans and they will become modified through that process. That's how we get new viruses. It's the same process. It's deadly serious, ladies and gentlemen. So let's hope that your medical professionals, the MDs out there, understand this theory, this unifying theory of biology, because, ladies and gentlemen, it is life and death. And as far as uh, the unifying theory of biology goes, if uh, you, you are a, a person of faith uh, in, into Hinduism, Brahman is one, we... we it kind of uh, kind of relates back to where uh, we are all interconnected in some way <laughs> and that we are all one and we are all uh, kind of experiencing the world in different ways based on our environment, our biology and everything else. What's, he, you say that? what's, what's he talking about? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't say that. 
Look, don't I get, <laughs> don't belittle it. It'll kill you. That you got to understand this theory. Yeah. It, it is life and death, not life or death. It's life and death. Understanding this is very important. And unfortunately, a, a lot of people uh, is so cutting edge. I think a lot of people don't understand it. Not even you know, like medical professionals, I think, don't understand the implications. So make sure you talk to your doctor and make sure they understand this because you wouldn't want to be treated by one who didn't understand this process. Yep. All right. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, answered a lot of questions. I was a bit facetious with that last I know, one. But, I know. But that, that's all good, you know. Um, uh, okay. So CDRI. Yeah. Chihuahua Desert Research Institute. If you want to experience this uh, unifying theory of biology in action, all you got to do is drive up uh, State Road 118, uh, five miles southeast of Fort Davis, about 18 miles northwest of Alpine, and check it out. Beautiful grassland, desert grassland up at the high elevations. You'll see all kinds of beautiful things. Take your whole family. Uh, get a You get yourself a, uh, a membership, and you can hike there anytime you want. And if you tell them the Science Night sent you, you get a discount. That's right. And you can see the unifying theory of biology everywhere. Everywhere you look, you'll you can if you once you, now that you know it, you're going to start seeing it everywhere you look. That's and they right. even label the unifying theory of biology it's on every single plant that's out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Their Big, botanical <laughs> garden is beautiful. Yeah. 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 Big signs and arrows. This is unifying theory of biology. <laughs> this is, this unifying is, theory. That's this right. is the result. And this, this is, is the result. Cousin. That's right. This is the result of this theory. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see you next week on these science nights. Be sure to tune in and uh, don't forget, you know, if you have questions, then uh, be sure and give us a call 432-217-1983, 432-217-1983. I remember 1983. I was a whole one years old. Good year. Yeah. Good year. Good year. Well, we'll see you next time on the science nights. Thanks for listening to this episode of Science Nights in the Morning. Be sure and follow us on Patreon for exclusive gear and uncut episodes. Check out the latest science articles on our Facebook page and subscribe to us on YouTube and your favorite podcast listening app. You can also listen every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time at BigBenRadio.com. And if you got a question, we'll join the discussion. Hit the hotline at 432-217-1983 and record your message. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for listening each and every week. That's Science Nights in the Morning with a K, and we'll see you next time.